Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. To mark the occasion, here's my review of Rise of Nations, along with its expansion pack, Thrones and Patriots, for PC and Mac. What you'll be seeing throughout this video is the extended edition, which is just the re-release of the game along with its expansion pack, and some tweaks and updates for more modern systems. This is a real-time strategy game developed by Big Huge Games and published by Microsoft in 2003 for PC and Mac, with the expansion pack Thrones and Patriots coming out the following year. Eventually, it would also be re-released in 2014 as the Extended Edition, which again is what you're seeing throughout this video, and the primary benefit of the Extended Edition is that it switched over the multiplayer component to use Steamworks as opposed to the original system that they had set up, and that makes things a lot easier for just about anybody to pick up and play. They don't need to worry about the online servers being down, they don't need to worry about creating additional accounts or anything like that. Just buy the game on Steam, boot it up, and then you can just hop right into the multiplayer if you want, or of course you can play it single player. And it also includes things like achievements and trading cards and such like that as well. Unlike with the Age of Empires and Age of Mythology re-releases, however, they did not include any extra content, there were no extra expansions or anything like that. It's just Rise of Nations with Thrones and Patriots, and it's just had its multiplayer component switched over to Steamworks, it's had a few visual tweaks, and that's pretty much it. So I'm not really going to talk about the Extended Edition all that much more. As for Rise of Nations along with Thrones and Patriots, it was a very well-received game overall, and the expansion pack was also very well-received. And while it didn't sell especially well, it did sell enough to justify them making a follow-up game, which was Rise of Nations Rise of Legends. And not only is that a radically different game than this, it's also a much less well-known game. Apparently it only sold about a third as many copies as Rise of Nations did, and I can pretty easily see why, but that's a subject for a different video. Rise of Nations itself, though, is a pretty interesting game because it combines the style of real-time strategy that you would see in the likes of, say, Age of Empires, with a lot of elements of empire building that you would see in the likes of Civilization. And when you consider that the lead designer was Brian Reynolds, who at that point was mainly known for his work on Sid Meier's Civilization 2 and Alpha Centauri, it just makes a lot of sense. The thing is, real-time strategy games a la Age of Empires and empire-building 4X games like Civilization are two very different genres that require different approaches. So what happens when you start to combine those elements into what we end up with in Rise of Nations? Does it end up working out really well, or does it end up being an overcomplicated mess, or how does it turn out? Well, let's just go ahead and start delving right into it and find out. And like always, we'll go ahead and start with the presentation, which is fairly standard for a real-time strategy game circa 2003. By that I mean the entire thing takes place from an isometric perspective, which means that it's that tilted top-down look. And while you are capable of zooming in, there is no lateral camera movement, it's always in that one fixed angle. There are 3D models with respect to things like the buildings and the characters and some of the environmental stuff, but since it's all taking place only from one perspective, the only time you're ever going to actually notice the 3D modeling is when characters are moving around. So when you've got your soldiers, or your citizens, or whatever other units you have moving around, you will notice that they are actual 3D models. But even then, most of the time you have to zoom in pretty far to actually see that. And when you zoom in really far, obviously you have a very limited perspective, so you're probably not going to spend much time zoomed in. As such, you probably won't notice any of the smaller touches they put into the visuals, like the tracks that are left when a vehicle moves along the ground, although that does only last a very short period after it moves along, so you're probably still not going to notice that anyway. But other than some small touches like that, there's really nothing noteworthy about the visuals. They are respectable given the genre this game is in, and it's pretty easy to tell buildings and units apart at a glance, which is exactly the kind of thing you really want out of a real-time strategy game's visuals. The extended edition did improve a few things here and there. It bumped up some texture quality and it also improved the water effects, but those really don't have all that much of an effect on the visuals and as a result you end up with visuals that are just decent. They're nothing amazing, they're nothing bad, they get the job done, the game runs well, and it's easy to tell what things are at a glance, 
so there's not really anything to complain about there. And apart from some of the interface text and buttons being a bit small for widescreen displays, given that the game was designed primarily around 4x3 displays and not widescreen, the user interface is clean and quite easy to work with. So while there's not really anything all that impressive about the visuals, they get the job done and get it done quite well. Then you move over into sound design and that's where things get a lot messier. The sound effects themselves are nothing remotely impressive, and in fact, they're on the weaker side. The gun and explosion sounds just don't have much impact behind them, the melee and archery and such sounds don't really have much impact behind them, and while the game does have different sound effects that'll play depending on which units or buildings you're selecting and operating, unfortunately, there's some weird issues with the sound in this game where it'll just not play certain sound effects at some times, but it does play them at others, and that is a bit annoying. It's certainly not a deal breaker, and all the sound effects that you need it to play, like the alert sounds, do play no matter what, but there's really no voice acting in the game unless you count the grunts and groans of units dying, and those are pretty weak as well. And between that and the sound effects themselves being fairly weak, there's just not much to latch onto there. What is quite a bit better, however, is the soundtrack. Now, the soundtrack is a bit all over the place in terms of theme, but there are a few tracks in it that are very nice, and the overall quality of the soundtrack is quite high. It does give a good impression of a strategy game taking place on a global scale that starts from the Ancient Age and goes all the way up to the Information Age, which is basically just current day. So when it comes to the sound design in general, if nothing else, they've definitely done a very good job with the soundtrack. It's just that the rest of it leaves a lot to be desired, and when you bring all of the presentation together, you end up with something that does work, but it's really not impressive, and some of its elements do drag the game down just a bit. But of course, what really matter here are the story, or rather lack thereof in this case, and especially the gameplay. Since this is a strategy game, the gameplay is always going to be more important than the story no matter what, but there really isn't a story in Rise of Nations. It does have a few campaigns that are themed around certain time periods, like an Alexander the Great campaign or a Cold War campaign, but there's not really any story behind those. It's just the theme that that campaign operates in, so it really just determines which part of the world it's going to take place in and what nations will be available for you to mess around with. So really, it does all fall to the gameplay, and that's where things do get quite interesting, because this is a combination of traditional real-time strategy elements like we would see from the likes of, say, Age of Empires, and more 4x empire building stuff like we would see in Civilization. Instead of finite resources like you have in most traditional base building real-time strategy games, in this you have resource production structures like farms or mines or universities, and those will gradually produce an amount of resources over time. They never run out as long as those buildings stay operational. And in order to get more of those particular resources, you can build more of those structures, although that will require you to expand your empire by building extra cities, which is a mechanic I'll talk about more in a moment. And you can also build certain structures that will enhance the outputs of the various resources, as well as research various technologies that will improve the resource gathering rates. Eventually you will hit a ceiling at which that gather rate can be improved, and from then on out, you'll need to expand that limit by going into the library and researching commerce techs, and certain wonders that you can build can also raise those limits for you. The basic resources you'll be using throughout the entire game to build structures, train units, etc. are food, timber, metal, oil, and wealth, and then there's also another resource called Knowledge that is used exclusively for researching tech. In addition to all of these basic resources, there are also rare resources scattered around the map, which you can send merchants to in order to set up shop and get the benefits of. These are things like, say, bison, which improve your food gathering rate, and also reduce the costs of researching tech at the granary. There are 31 of these resources available in the game, and it's generally a smart idea to look for where these resources are and try to expand towards them if you can, that way, you can build up a defensive area around that resource and continue to gain its benefits, 
while also not having to worry about enemies coming in and raiding and taking down your merchant, resulting in losing the benefits of that resource until you can get another merchant over there to set up shop again. And expanding your territory is more complicated than just continuing to build out towards wherever you're trying to get to, like you do in most other base building real-time strategy games. In this, you also have national borders to worry about. You can only build within friendly territory, whether that be your own borders or within the borders of your allies as well. And in order to expand your borders, you're going to be needing to build additional cities as well as things like forts to push the borders out further and further. The number of cities you can have is based on the civic tech that you have unlocked, so researching civics tech will increase the number of cities you can build, which is also important for resource production because certain structures can only be built, say, once per city or up to five per city in the case of farms, and you can also only build one wonder per city. Wonders are very large structures that are pretty expensive to build and take a long time to build, but once they're complete, give you some significant benefits. For example, if you build the Angkor Wat, then that will increase your metal gather rate by 50%, your commerce limit for metal by 100, which is a very significant increase, and it also reduces the cost of barracks, stable, and dock units by 25%. The thing is, these are all world wonders, so there's only one of them that can be present on the map at any given time, so you need to be pretty quick about building those wonders whenever you can. And of course, if an enemy manages to build it before you, then, well, just capture the city that it's present in, and then you'll get access to all of its benefits. You can capture an enemy city by reducing its hit points down to nothing, at which point you can then capture it by sending infantry in to attack it, and then after a period of time during assimilation phase, the city will become yours and you will gain access to all of its buildings and all of the benefits of those buildings, including expanding your national borders, which in turn, of course, increases the amount of area that you can build in, but also the amount of area that you can gain tax revenue from, which is just constant wealth income that's generated by temples, as well as expanding the area which enemy units can suffer attrition on. Attrition is a mechanic that you have to research in the game, but once you've researched it, then enemy units will just gradually take damage while they're in your territory, and the way you stop this is by having either a supply wagon or certain types of general units nearby, so that they can prevent the units that are near them from suffering attrition. At first, the attrition damage rate is fairly low, but over time, as you continue to improve your research, it will get more and more significant, and eventually you'll hit the point where attrition is actually a significant danger, so you're going to be needing to micromanage the living hell out of your units. And that process can be a bit annoying, because you can't really do all that much with unit formations. There are very limited options there, and because your infantry units are composed of three individual soldiers each, that means you're dealing with a pretty wide spread of units that are a bit clunky to control compared to other strategy games. And more importantly, you're having to deal with the hard counter system that is built into the game, where every single unit has something it's weak against and something it's strong against, and if you use that unit in a different context, then it's just not going to be very effective. As an example, an anti-tank unit is basically useless against anything that's not a tank. So on top of the widespread of units because of the way the formations work, you're having to deal with each individual unit needing to be used in specific countering situations, and that can make the process of trying to micromanage all of your units rather frustrating. You're just constantly having to keep an eye on all of your units to make sure you don't end up with the chaotic blob of units going up against another chaotic blob of units and getting wiped out because they were just attacking the wrong types of units for whatever they're good against. And if you're not into heavy micromanagement, then that can get really tedious really quickly. And while that's all frustrating enough when you're only dealing with infantry, cavalry, and artillery, when you start throwing aircraft into the mix, it gets a lot more chaotic a lot more quickly. And then you have the further complication of once you get fairly high in the tech tree, you have access to ballistic missiles, which have a ridiculously long range. And you have to be very careful with the particularly spicy variant of those, because those will affect the Armageddon clock, and once that counts all the way down, it's game over. Your main ways of achieving victory are going to be either by constructing a certain amount of wonders and then surviving the countdown clock, or if you've just got the wonder victory, then instantly winning once you hit that certain number of points. 
capturing a certain amount of territory by expanding your national borders and the borders of your allies to the point where you control a certain amount of the map, or by simply capturing enemy capitals until you've captured all of the enemy capitals and they are considered to have lost. There are also a few alternate game modes that you can mess around with, like the fairly unique Assassin mode where it's a free-for-all, but everybody is assigned a specific target that they need to eliminate, and once they've eliminated that target, they're given a new one until eventually they've eliminated all the targets. But for the most part, it's a pretty straightforward real-time strategy game of the classic base-building type, just with a lot of these more empire-building mechanics thrown onto it. And when you throw in the Thrones and Patriots expansion, you also get an additional empire building mechanic in the form of government. You can build a senate building, which will then allow you to select a government type. It starts out with either despot or republic, each of which has its own specific bonuses and will give you a special general unit that will have its own special benefits as well. And as you continue to progress through the ages, you will get opportunities to change your government type, retaining the benefits of your previous one, but also getting new benefits on top of that. But that's really the only major mechanical change that was introduced with the Thrones and Patriots expansion. It was primarily just extra content. More nations to mess around with, more units to mess around with, and the four Conquer the World campaigns that are specific time frames like Alexander the Great and the Cold War. This, of course, brings me to the campaigns themselves. What are they like? Are they more traditional, real-time strategy campaigns where they just follow a series of events, or are they something a bit different? Well, they definitely fall into the different category, at least as of 2003 when this game was released. Because the campaign style in Rise of Nations has been described as risk-like. What do I mean by that? Well, you have territories that you need to control. You control them by conquering them, and once you have conquered a territory, you gain access to its resources, you can build things within it, and of course you can train armies within it. As you continue to send your armies into these various territories and expanding your territory, that will lead you closer and closer to victory. Once you go to try to capture a territory, it cuts over to the real-time strategy layer, where it plays out more like a standard versus match, where you're just going up against the AI in the case of the campaign, and you're really just trying to complete the standard gameplay mode and try to achieve a normal victory, and once you have achieved that victory, then the territory is yours, you get access to all of its benefits, and then you can move on to the next territory. This style of campaign is very hit or miss. And by that I mean some people absolutely love it. I mean, after all, tons of people absolutely love the campaign in Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War Dark Crusade. Here's the problem with that from my perspective, because I represent the other group of people when it comes to this style of campaign. The group of people who don't like it. Now, I don't like the campaign not because it's bad or anything, but because I don't want to go into a strategy game campaign and just feel like it's stringing together a bunch of skirmish matches. If I wanted to play skirmish matches, I would just go play skirmish matches, and that's what I do. I'm part of that group that prefers strategy game campaigns that offer unique challenges that aren't really related to skirmish matches at all, and maybe even tell a decent story along the way. That doesn't necessarily mean the campaign style that is present in Rise of Nations is bad, it just means that that's not what I'm looking for in a real-time strategy game. That's ultimately the main dilemma you're going to have with the campaigns in Rise of Nations. All of them are just variants on this Conquer the World style where you have a bunch of territory and you're trying to move pieces on the board across these territories, and it just leads to a bunch of skirmish matches. It's a style of campaign where you either like it or you don't, and there's not going to be any in-between there. So as far as the campaigns of Rise of Nations goes, they are mechanically sound, they have their strategic merits, it's just that it's going to be completely up to the individual whether or not they're even going to be remotely interested in them. So unfortunately, about the best I can really say for the campaigns of Rise of Nations is, your mileage will vary. And unfortunately, that's also something I can say about the various nations that you can play as. There are a lot of them in this game. 24 to be exact, each of which has its own specific bonuses to different production types, as well as a selection of unique units. 
and while the bonuses themselves are generally applicable throughout the entire game, the selection of unique units is not. Some nations have unique units that are only available in the earlier ages, so basically ancient age on up through medieval period. Some of them have units that are only available towards the end of the game, so industrial age on up through information age. And some of them have a widespread of units that are good throughout pretty much the entire game, like, say, the Germans, who have heavy infantry units that are available throughout most of the historical periods. And once they get up to the more modern ages, they gain access to some different units, like Tiger Tanks or Volksgrenadiers. So you end up with a situation where even though you can play a nation throughout the entire width of history, they're really only best played in certain periods, and so it makes them generally feel a bit unbalanced. Now sure, the unique units in this game aren't truly unique. They're basically reskins of standard unit types with some stat tweaks, but it's still a bit disappointing when, say, you progress into some of the more modern eras as, say, the Romans, and you lose access to your legions, and they just end up turning into standard infantry units. And while it certainly does make sense from a historical perspective, it's just disappointing from a gameplay perspective. It is still pretty decently balanced from a mechanical standpoint, so you're not going to have any massive disadvantages if you play one particular faction versus another, but it does produce a bit of an uneven experience, and it does incentivize you to limit the time frames depending on which factions are being played, at least in the sense that if you all want to be using unique units on a fairly regular basis, then you're going to need to do that. But apart from the annoyances of trying to micromanage your units, and the fact that the game's scale is a bit ambitious for a real-time strategy game of this type, thus resulting in a bit of a sense of overload, most of the issues with Rise of Nations are really more personal preference problems than anything else. For the most part, it's a very solid real-time strategy game that tries to expand the genre a bit beyond simply being a base-building real-time strategy game and trying to include some more empire-building elements. And sure, the Thrones and Patriots expansion is basically just here, have a bunch of extra content and doesn't really affect the gameplay mechanics all that much. But at the time this released, that really wasn't all that unusual. Most expansion packs maybe added in a new mechanic or two, but mostly just focused on adding more content and refining existing mechanics. And that's exactly what happens with this. And while the campaigns themselves are very much a you either like it or you don't kind of thing, there is a decent amount of content on offer there, and if you're just looking for multiplayer and skirmish battles, then you'll definitely be able to enjoy Rise of Nations quite a bit. But if you want more out of your campaigns than just a bunch of skirmish matches that are tied together by basically a turn-based board game, then you'll find the amount of content on offer is actually fairly limited, and you might want to look for a sale if you're interested in giving the game a try. I definitely wouldn't recommend this as an entry point to the real-time strategy game genre, however. It's definitely more for veteran real-time strategy game players, who will definitely be able to see the merits of this 4 out of 5 experience. If you're newer to the real-time strategy genre, then you'll definitely want to stick with something a bit simpler, like, say, Age of Empires 2. But if you're already comfortable with real-time strategy games and you're looking for something a bit more complicated, then Rise of Nations will certainly fit the bill. Just be aware of what you're getting yourself into, because if you're not all that big of a fan of micromanagement, then you're probably going to have a bit of a rough time with Rise of Nations. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope you've had a great Thanksgiving holiday. If you like the content on my channel, please consider supporting it on Patreon. All the revenue from that goes directly back into the channel, whether it be getting more games for review, or replacing broken equipment, or getting new equipment, or whatever the case may be. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that is perfectly fine. I understand. But the option's there if you're interested. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all in later videos.